Hi, welcome or welcome back. My name is Brittany and this is my March wrap up. Just as a little side note, uh, in my March video, that was like end of February, very beginning of March. And I was like manifesting spring. I wanted sunshine and spring so bad. And in the month of March and even into April, like it keeps snowing, it keeps snowing. Oh my God. Like, no, we'll get teased with like one or two sunny days, things will melt and then it fucking dumps again. And I'm like, oh my God, like I just want spring so bad. <laughs> so it's just really cute to like look back at that video and see how naive and young I am to the fact it was gonna keep snowing. <laughs> Anyways, I had a really good reading month in March. I picked up a bunch of random things, some great things. Like, I don't know, overall it was a good month. So let's just dive right in. I read 11 books in March, seven were audio and four were physical books. And we're just gonna go in order of the month. I started off pretty strong with The Tears of Amber by Sophia Segovia, translated by Simon Bruni, narrated by Will, Draymond, and Angela Daw. So, when I read this, it was on Kindle Unlimited as an ebook and audiobook. So if it sounds interesting, see if it's still there. Um, highly recommend. I, it was a fantastic experience. This follows two German families during the rise of Hitler. First of all, we get a lot of Jewish stories and I think their stories of suffering and survival are really, really important and impactful to read. I personally have never read or I feel like seen a lot of stories from the German's point of view. And so this was a, just a really fascinating book to explore just from that like context. To digress slightly, In the Will of the Many by James Eilington, that is a fantasy book that came out. Um, hopefully the series will continue this year. Uh, there's basically like an argument between our main character, Viss, and a rebel group. And the rebel group is like, no, the hierarchy, the governors, like the people who run the society are all bad and everyone else underneath them is also bad and needs to die because they're supporting the government. And this is like, I don't agree with that. Like I've met these people within the society, within the structure, and they're literally just doing the best they can. Like, I don't think everyone needs to die. I think the problem is at the top of the pyramid, at the top of the structure. And I don't know, I just kept thinking about that book while reading Tears of Amber because I think maybe that same thought process could be there, like all Germans are bad, like they supported Hitler, blah, 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 blah. But you get to actually see these two families like initially support Hitler. Like the book literally opens up with Ilse at two years old and Arno at three going to the parade where they see Hitler and like their families and their parents are excited. This like new political power, these new promises, like these hopes and dreams. But like, as the book goes on, like the parents are like, oh God, <laughs> like, like we don't want slaves on our property. Like, why are we getting these Polish laborers? Like, we're not like, we don't want that. Or they are scared because they see people who don't outwardly support Hitler. Like, don't say that, like you're gonna get killed. Like they're starting to see like the Germans turning on Germans now and you see them kind of go along with stuff, but like share, like we get their private thoughts about how like fucked up things are and how they don't like it. And like, well, we don't wanna go to war. Like what is going on? So you get to see this like up and down of, you know, just trying to survive essentially. I mean. Everyone I feel like in hard times does the best they can. And you really get to see that with these families as they like come to the realization of like how turbulent, destructive, awful things are becoming and like their viewpoints and opinions really shift. And I just thought that was super fascinating to explore as a perspective within World War II because like you learn like these families are, they're so sweet, they're so kind and like they're just as scared as everybody else and like I don't know, I just really liked that exploration. Overall, the story of their survival is really, really beautiful and heartbreaking. Um, Ilse and Arno as main characters and as they grow up are so sweet. And we get to watch these like individual stories happening and then they ultimately come together and like, I'm literally getting goosebumps, oh my God. <laughs> ah! um, it was just a cool story. And like what made this even cooler, if I may, was the author's note at the end of the book. So if you check this out, like please read the author's note because I finished the book, I thought it was really good and read the author's note. I was like, holy shit, like what? <laughs> the author's note and like the insight you get from where this story came from 
just changed my whole reading experience and I just like fucking cried. <laughs> it was so cool. Sofia Segovia really loves to highlight quiet, lesser known stories of survival in history. And I, I think this book was a really great example of it. I will keep singing her praises. Um, Simon Bruni also translated this really well. The audiobook narration, like their performance was amazing. Like, oh, it was such a good book. It was such like a solid start to the reading month. The next book I picked up was Ghosts by Dolly Alderton. I mean, like two for two, I was so proud that I was picking up books. I was telling you I was gonna pick up <laughs> and we did it. This follows Nina in her thirties. And I feel like just like a lot of us, there's areas of her life where she's thriving. Like she's an author, she has a new book deal. Her and her best friend Lola are just like having fun. Her and her ex-boyfriend, they're finally in a good place that's like amicable and they're able to like just be friends. But then like she's lonely, like she wants a new relationship. Her dad is suffering from Alzheimer's. Her mom is not coping with it well. So their relationship is strained. And then she has another friend who's a mom and like their relationship is like not doing great either. So you really just follow Nina through all like the messy parts of life. Things just take a turn when she finally decides to like jump in, start online dating and she meets Max. And Max is wonderful. Oh my God, he's handsome, he's perfect. Um, he's mysterious and rugged, like all the things, right? He says on the first date, like, I'm gonna marry you. He says, I love you, you know, months later after they've been dating and he fucking ghosts her. Ghost, <laughs> so rude. <laughs> like, first of all, God bless you if you are online dating because this book made it sound horrible and how rude to just go somebody like if you don't want to be with someone just tell them like just be an adult about it that's it it was really sad because he i feel like he definitely strung her along like he definitely played games like by not telling her like he was done or scared like and just shut her off like you just see what that does to her she also is really struggling with her father and his dementia because as she's going through this heartbreak that really gets worse her and her mom like there's a lot of tension there like overall the story was decent it got a little wacky at the end like i don't know how to explain it but nina made some interesting choices at the end some things were resolved um some things weren't her and her mom like their relationship and their arc was actually really beautiful lola her best friend is super fun to follow lola is like so caring so loving so like girly and silly but just like really has a tender heart i just really loved lola nina and her mom friend like they do have like a really nice heart to heart they finally talk about their shit and like they end up in a good place <laughs> i saw one review that i thought was really funny <laughs> and i kind of agree but it basically said like that they had wished nina and lola just realized that men suck and had a wonderful lesbian love affair and the book would have been better. And I think that would have been a very funny alternate timeline to explore <laughs> because men do suck in this book. Nina and Lola don't have the best experience, but I feel like they come out just more sure of themselves in a strange way, like sure in their friendships and like what they want. Um, it's just more of like a slice of life, maybe of just like the ups and downs in your thirties and dating. I would like to check out another Dolly Alderton to see if I prefer it more. This was like an average three star for me. I like some things about it, not a new fave, but I'd just like to see how her other books stack up. The next book I read was The Women by Kristen Hanna, narrated by Julia Whelan, and this did not disappoint. I had kind of thought through like what to expect from this book, like what I was hoping to get out of it, and Kristen Hanna, her writing, her story, and Julia Whelan's delivery was like, oh, chef's kiss. It was so good. It was so good, but it was also like a really incredibly hard read. Like I felt teary eyed on like the second page. There's a lot of emotion in this book. It really does dive into PTSD following war, specifically the Vietnam War. Frankie joins the Army Nurse Corps to go to, over to Vietnam to follow in her brother's footsteps. And while she's there, she experiences so much like growth as a person, as a nurse. Like I thought all of the nursing scenes, like how you feel as a brand new nurse when you're finally working like frankie's like i can't do this like why am i here like those feelings were so true like there's a huge education to bedside gap in nursing when you finally get out there i thought that was great all the scenes in the or 
in combat nursing I thought were really well done. So you get like her healthcare trauma, her war trauma, what happens when she comes home. Like people were not celebrated when they came home from Vietnam. I am not a historical person at all, but like having this story like was so enlightening and Frankie was such an incredibly likable character to root for that I was like, wow, like this happened? Like what the hell? <laughs> like, oh my God. It just really helped connect me to that time in history through Frankie. Frankie herself, like her arc is really fascinating and really upsetting in a way in that like she is like screaming from the rooftops that she needs help and she does not get it. At this time in history, things are not talked about. Like we don't address emotions. You just take your pills and move on with your day. And not only is she struggling like from her time in the service, but like women weren't recognized as a serving. So there just were a lot of things that went into Frankie's return home. And really like there just felt like time since she just got like fucking knocked down like again and again and again. And it's like, oh my God. But I also feel like that was incredibly realistic for someone struggling. I don't know, like just the way that like your life can spiral out of control. Like all these things just kept happening to her. And like, you're just like watching it like a fucking car wreck. But like, it seemed very realistic for what she was going through. The ending, I'd say it was like somewhat satisfying, but again, realistic because there's some resolution. Like it's not like the happiest of stories. There's some good that comes out of it ultimately. Overall, really impactful, highly, highly, highly recommend. The next book I picked up was Mostly Dead Things by Kristen Arnett. This is my next book in my weird book reading vlog series. So stay tuned for that later this week. I'm really excited. This was a strange book for sure. <laughs> and like the more I've sat on it, like I think I liked it. <laughs> I didn't love it as much as Night Bitch, which was the first book in my weird book series. Um, but overall, like it was really fascinating. It was super strange. Um, I talk more about it in my reading vlog, but just the quick synopsis. Jessa Lynn's father has committed suicide and she is now in charge of their family's taxidermy business. The entire family is struggling with the loss of, you know, their father, the husband. Her mom is coping in a very unique way in that she is creating like lewd pornographic art involving the taxidermy animals. <laughs> And then like Jessa and her brother, like their relationship was strained because Jessa was having an affair with her brother's wife. So like messiness all around. There is, I would say some content warnings for suicide. We do get very descriptive uh, scenes about Jessa finding her father. And then the like taxidermy animal stuff itself is also very descriptive. So just know that's what you're getting into. <laughs> but it was like strange and it ended up working for me, so. If you've read it, let me know. I'm definitely curious what other people think or if I'm just like sick and twisted. <laughs> the next book I picked up was I Have Some Questions For You by Rebecca Mackay, narrated by Julie Whelan. I remember seeing this a lot last year and then the fact it was narrated by Julia just was like, okay, we'll just listen to it. So I didn't know what this book was going into it. I just was along for the ride. This ultimately follows Bodie Kane, who is a successful podcaster. She talks about um, like films and is essentially invited back to her boarding school um, like the high school she went to, to teach other students podcasting and like techniques and how to do this as a profession. When she was in school though, her roommate was found dead and the guy was arrested, he's been in jail, but going back to the school like has really just reopened this murder for Bodhi and she gets involved again when one of her students wants to investigate it and do her podcast on the murder of Talia King. The Goodreads tags for this book says it's a thriller. I wouldn't really say it was thrilling. Like it didn't really have me on the edge of my seat. Like it wasn't scary, high, intense, super thrilling. It was definitely a mystery. Like I wanted to know what was happening, but I wouldn't say there was a lot of like tension. There are also a lot of themes of like misogyny, harassment, like grooming, abuse and children. Like there's a lot of things within this novel and the issues within the justice system, which was really fascinating. Like overall the story like definitely kept me engaged, but it didn't really wrap up in a way I was hoping for. Um, it was a solid narration by Julia Whelan. Like overall, there's a, a few writing choices I really enjoyed. There's a few times where the character is talking to you 
like as the person, which was kind of interesting. Here's something for you, Mr. So-and-so. I didn't think it was you at first. At first I thought it was this person. Like that's how it's coming across. And so that was just like an, a unique narration style for main character. Overall, like it was average. It was an interesting listen. It helped me clean my room. <laughs> Three stars. If it sounds interesting, check it out. Maybe not my favorite like mystery or thriller, but still a fun time. The next one I picked up was a novella by Kelly Barnhill, The Crane Husband. So I have seen Elliot Brooks talk about this book. It's one of her favorites and I need to pick up more Kelly Barnhill. <laughs> I actually have When Women Were Dragons. So I would love to pick that up sooner than later because this is the second Kelly Barnhill book I've read. She accomplished something really great in this novella. It's maybe, I think it's 120 pages and it follows an unnamed 15 year old girl who ultimately is the victim of domestic abuse. Um, her mother is an artist. She's a very frivolous woman. Our main character ends up taking care of the household, is kind of in charge of finances. She takes care of her younger brother, making sure he gets off to school. While her mom does her art, one day her mom brings home a new husband who is a crane. And it's a very strange book because the man her mom brings home is a literal bird. <laughs> like he is a crane. But then there's other moments where you get to see the human beneath. Um, and it's just a very interesting take on domestic abuse in the home and how that affects the other people in the home mainly. Because her main character, like she's, while she's young, she's not dumb. She sees what's happening and does her best to keep herself and her brother safe. And it's really sad that children are sometimes put in that position to be the parent of the household. The world itself was also really interesting because it's set on like a small cottage on the edge of a farm. So it maybe feels like it's going to be like set in history, but there's drones that fly around the farm to keep people out of it, to keep predators off from destroying the crops. And then the social worker that a main character uh, comes across is wearing glasses with recorders in it. Like she's like, I'm recording this conversation through her little glasses. And so there was like a slight futuristic feel to the story. It was a beautifully written, really impactful for such a short story. It's definitely like an unsatisfying ending. Like some parts were like good, but bad. But I just think like that's more realistic to the horrible situation that it is, right? Like I feel like there's no winners in that type of situation. It was just a kind of a dark story, but still really well done. And if it sounds interesting, definitely check it out. Just know like that's the main theme of the novel is domestic abuse and involving kids. The next book I picked up was The Ragging Retreat by Julia Bartz. Um, this was my second attempt getting it on Libby and I successfully finished the book. <laughs> so this is a debut novel from Julia and I'd say it was off, like it was pretty good. The more I've sat with it, the more I like it. And it was so strange. It was definitely a weird, um, twisty, turny, I would call this a thriller. Like there were times where this was intense, uh, unsettling, like, you're not sure what's gonna happen. Like I made the mistake of trying to read this book and like read and fall asleep in preparation for some night shifts. And I didn't end up taking a nap. <laughs> like I read the whole book. So like definitely was the wrong book to fall asleep to. But this follows our main character, Alex, who is an aspiring author. And she gets a chance to go to Rosa Vallo's home. And Rosa Vallo has written some very strange books, which like as a side note, I would wanna read her books also. Like her books, the way they're described in the book, the books within the book <laughs> sound very cool, very strange. And I think they would have been great additions to my weird book series. Rosa Vallo is a very eclectic, mysterious, strange, but like gorgeous woman with like a flair for the dramatic, this like auburn haired woman who wears like headscarves and is like, oh darling. And like, <laughs> she's got this air about her and maybe she like wears like, a silk robe during the day and she just writes at her computer but will like call people out and be very like vicious at times like she's a very unique character I don't know like I have like an image of her in my head and she's so fascinating Alex gets a chance to go to this author's home and like be mentored by her and learn from her and like hopefully get through this writer block she's been struggling with. And it is like an opportunity of a lifetime. Few other women are invited to this retreat. And one of the women is her ex-best friend and you get some really juicy drama between the two of them. Sometimes when stories use like 
that I have a secret or like something happened between us but I can't talk about it. Sometimes when that isn't a story, I'm usually let down. <laughs> like the big reveal ends up not being big enough for me. I'm like, oh, that's it? Like, that's what y'all stressing about? <laughs> like, that was your big secret. The conflict between Alex and her best friend or her ex-best friend when we meet her, um, that was great. Like, it was a legit conflict. Like, it was juicy. It was reasonable. It made sense for me. I'm like, well, yeah, I'd be fucking pissed too. <laughs> like, I can see why you hate each other. Like, this is messy. And I really liked it. Um, it did not let me down. When we finally got those answers, I'm like, oh, yeah. Like, ooh, that's good. The story, like, the whole writing retreat is complicated, right? So now Alex is at her favorite author's home. She's like, she's got this writer's block. She's excited to learn. But like, oh, shit, my ex-best friend is here. There's all this drama. We're stuck in this remote house. But the kind of kicker is that these women are all expected to write a full length novel in 30 days with the chance to win a million dollars, a book tour with Rosa, basically instant fame and success with Rosa backing it. It goes fine so far. There's a few strange things that happen, but about halfway through the retreat, a woman is missing. And like that is where the story really takes off. It's twisty and turny and like you don't know who to trust, like you don't know what's going on. It's also a very queer story. So if you're looking for some LGBTQ rep in your books, like that is explored. So that adds like an extra layer of tension throughout the novel in a house full of women. There are so many like stories within this story too. We learn about Rosa's like stories and her success as an author. And then all of the women have their different stories. I don't know, just it was a really interesting, fun, crazy time. And I thoroughly enjoyed it as a thriller mystery. And I'm excited to see what this author keeps doing. The next book I finished was an audiobook, The Thursday Murder Club, book two, The Man Who Died Twice by Richard Oseman, narrated by Leslie Manville. This series, <laughs> I really like it. It's been so fun. I am just patiently waiting for my Libby hold for book three to come out so I can keep going. Um, but I think this is going to end up being a new favorite. The Thursday Murder Club follows our four main characters, Elizabeth, Joyce, Ron, and Ibrahim. And they live in a retirement community uh, called Cooper's Chase in a fictional town, Fairhaven near Kent in the UK. I highly recommend this series as an audiobook because you have an English author, an English narrator, and all of the English humor just hits differently while listening to it. I don't know if anyone has read this series, like physically read the books and you're not from the UK, you're not from Europe or England. Like I would be super fascinated to know if like the humor, like if you catch on to it while reading because like American and like English humor are very different. So like, I don't know if I would have caught on to all the funny bits if I had just been reading it. And it is so like subtle in its humor and its cleverness. Like it's a very clever series. <laughs> like I don't know how else to describe it, but like the way things weave together and like the way the humor is delivered is so funny. Like I'll just be listening and the next thing I know, I'm just like giggling my ass off because it's so funny. The first book follows our crew and every Thursday they meet to discuss cold cases and bond over murder. And like they finally get their big break when a developer for Cooper's Chase is found dead on the property. The second book follows our characters about a week after the events of the first book. And now there are 20 million pounds worth of diamonds at stake and murders keep happening. <laughs> so we learn more about Elizabeth and her backstory. Ron is like advocating for his friend Ibrahim who is assaulted. Joyce and Elizabeth, like they just get up to shenanigans. Like oh, there are some really beautiful moments in this book. I have a feeling as the series keeps going, I'm probably going to cry. <laughs> like I just, I just know it. I'm gonna try to describe some of the humor. So like there is a scene in the second book where Joyce and Elizabeth are being interrogated <laughs> and the interrogators are like, where's your phone, Elizabeth? Where is it? We need your cell phone. And she's like, well, I don't know. You just forget things as you get older. Like, I don't know, it could be anywhere. <laughs> and like, there's this whole back and forth. And Elizabeth is like, well, you can search my house. Like, I just wanna make sure it's like tidied up when you're done. And the interrogators are like, well, we always like, it's, it's procedure. We always clean the houses when we're done. Like we will leave it in tip top shape, we promise. And Joyce next to her is like, you know, you might wanna check my bathroom for her phone. It's very dirty in there. <laughs> 
Joyce is like wanting them to clean her bathroom while they're like looking for her friend's phone. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's just so silly, so funny. Um, I am really loving this series and I cannot wait to continue. The next book I finished was another audiobook. This was A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson, narrated by Full Cast. I actually listened to this in like early 2020 and then it only came out in 2019. And it's kind of crazy because I feel like that was during like the strange like fugue year for me where like I don't remember much of 2020 because <laughs> I was like no way like it felt like I listened to this book so long ago but it was only a couple years so I don't know that was a trip I enjoyed this book again um I think it's really fun it is a really unique listening experience which I would highly recommend because you do get sound effects um Pippa herself like her delivery is really good um, there's just some really cool production choices that you would only get by listening. Um, and again, I enjoyed it. Um, I am going to put this series on my list as um, like audiobooks to basically have on deck. If you watched my April TBR, you know, I kind of struggled with having books ready to go as far as audiobooks and like listening content. So this story follows Pippa and she decides to investigate the murder suicide of Andy Bell and Sal Singh which happened in her hometown about five years prior. So she remembers these kids from school and as her like senior capstone project, she decides to look into it because she's not too sure Sal is actually guilty. First of all, it's just really fascinating. Like what high school are you going to? Are you gonna investigate a local murder? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like she actually like interviews people, calls a police station, requests documents. Like, I don't know like reading like re-listening to this as a like you know a couple years older i'm like what school are you going to like how are they letting you do this anyways <laughs> i digress but yeah pippa just starts investigating and new details come to light and she finds herself in a little bit of danger as she tries to get to the bottom of what really happened the night andy and sal died lots of twists and turns like the investigative process i thought was really cool like pippa's train of thought um, there's a few times she probably should have asked for help and gotten an adult involved because <laughs> um, things do get dangerous for her. But overall, like the ending is really explosive. Like, I don't know, you think it's going one way and it doesn't. Like, I don't know, it just ended up being a really fun time. And like I said, like this will be a series I continue via audiobook as the my holds come available. The second to last book I read was Warrior Girl Unearthed by Angeline Bully, narrated by Isabel Star LeBlanc. So this takes place 10 years after The Firekeeper's Daughter. So in The Firekeeper's Daughter, we have Donis, who is our main character. This book follows her nieces, Perry and Pauline, primarily Perry. I enjoyed it, but not as much as The Firekeeper's Daughter. This book, I think just maybe was more of a love story, like a way to really highlight the fact that, um, like indigenous remains, like their ancestors, their artifacts are used in museums versus like the people getting to bury their families. That's a concept I've never really thought about. But when I like think about like my own family, like, yeah, that would be kind of weird to see like my grandma's bones in a museum. Like, wait a minute, like <laughs> that's a little strange, right? So the story starts off with Perry, like kind of getting in trouble and she ends up doing like a summer internship for a museum owner. And that's where she like learns about this as a problem where like her ancestors bones are being obtained illegally. There's sketchy ways that the you know universities are going about getting these ancestral bones, relics, remains. And she becomes really passionate and involved in trying to get her ancestors home. Murder happens like they end up trying to pull off a heist. I mean, it was a really, I think, powerful and important message and topic I'm, a, I'm interested in. I thought it was a, a unique way to like use Perry and the you know inhabitants of Sugar Island to investigate this as a problem. And you can tell the author herself is really passionate about this. Like I said, I didn't love this as much as that first book. I don't know, the first book had like intrigue and mystery and murder like right off the bat and like a really propulsive plot. Whereas this one like took a lot more time, like we got a lot more of the backstory, the history, like 
the situation that's going on and then we get into like the intrigue but just for me personally I didn't connect to it as much. The audiobook narrator is the same for both of these novels and I think she does a beautiful job with the native Anishinaabe words like just listening to her speak that language is so beautiful and I think like for me I would have lost a lot of like the beautiful sounds and words had I just read it physically. So definitely recommend as an audiobook if it sounds interesting to you. Also like highly recommend The Firekeeper's Daughter which you do need to read first. Um, but yeah overall like was a decent kind of random audiobook pickup for me. And the last one was a short story. This is not a full-length novel. The audiobook is like an hour <laughs> and that is The Grown Up by Gillian Flynn narrated by Julia Whelan. I talked about this in my April TBR and it's already done. <laughs> So I did like sneak it in kind of last minute end of the month of March. It follows our unnamed main character. She is a sex worker and she gets the opportunity to be like a psychic and perform tarot reads. So she jumps on it and meets a woman named Susan and Susan comes to her like in distress and is like my stepson is evil like there's something wrong with the house like you know our main character does this reading and susan's like please come to the house and help me and our main character's like sure easy money but it's not as easy as she thought it was going to be so that's all i will really say because it is so short i don't want to spoil anything it started off really funny it was very twisty and turny overall it's a little unsatisfying just because it is such a short story like i think a lot of people when you look on goodreads are upset like they didn't realize it was a novella it was a short story it was part of another collection and then it's been like on its own now um so just know like it is a short story so like a lot of things are unresolved like a lot of questions are unanswered like i needed more but overall like it was a fun quick listen like it was an interesting story so that was my march wrap up it was a good one <laughs> What was your favorite book in March? I want to know. I want to add to my TBR and reading list. I hope you have a wonderful April and I will see you in the next one. Bye.